Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Oak Bridge. Um, make sure that after service, um, you go out across to the Connect Room, and you'll pick up one of these new guest brochures, and you can get a free drink from our cafe and a free T-shirt, so that's kind of cool. Um, a couple things to note, especially if this is your first time, we don't do an offering in our service, um, but if Oak Bridge is your home and if you believe in the mission that God's doing here. We have joy boxes all around the campus where you can give with a smile on your face. Second of all, secondly, we um, don't do communion in our service, but there's an awesome room right behind me. It's called the Reflection Room, and if you've never been in there, believe me, you want to go in there. It's so great. We have communion in there. You can do prayer requests. There's people that will pray over you. It's a really sweet experience. Um, next thing to note, today at 1230 is Explore Oak Bridge. So if you're a guest, it's perfect for you. Or even if you've been going here for a while, but you still don't know exactly what we're all about, that's a great thing to check out. So today at 1230. Next, we have our Understanding the Bible class. This is going to be June 30th at 7 p.m. at Oak Bridge City. Um, that is a, probably going to be a very helpful class. Um, I don't know that much about it, but I would encourage that you go, because that's what Tom told me. <laughs> um, next is our VBS signups. We're still pushing this. Sign up your kids. It's going to be a great week full of fun and games and learning about Jesus. And you need to get them signed up so that we know exactly how many t-shirts to order. We don't want a kid showing up and not having a t-shirt for them, because that'd be really sad. And we still need volunteers for that as well. So please sign up if you feel that God is calling you to volunteer. Um, and then, again, reference your uh, bulletin. We have a lot more announcements in there. Um, those were just some of our key points for today. I hope I did okay, because I was just told I was going to be up here alone. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and then we're going to get into worship. So close your eyes, bow your heads, and pray with me. Dear God, I just thank you so much for this day. I thank you that you brought every single person in this room here with an intention. I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to this message that Tom's going to give. I pray that you would soften our hearts. I pray that whatever baggage we walked in here today, that you would just lift that weight off of our shoulders. I pray that this time of worship would be a time that we can surrender to you and not worry about the people standing to the left or our right and just focus on you. Um, I thank you so much just again for this day and bless our time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Why don't you guys stand up and worship with us this morning?
the scripture that they're going to put up on the board. You know, our next song called Broken Vessels just talks about how we're all broken and without the mercy and the grace of God, we would all be in trouble. So if you guys would read Ephesians 2, we're going to start at verse 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by, by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, and it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's my favorite part. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So as you listen to this song, just think about the things through our life that where God has rescued us, where God has showed us mercy, and God has showed us grace. And sing along with these words to us, if you would. Sing the rich like 
you feel comfortable this morning, we just reach your hands out in front of you, just like this, in a posture of praise. Just sit in the presence of the Lord for just a moment. Father, we're so grateful for every blessing and everything that you give to us. We just open our hands and our hearts today, God, to receive whatever it is that you have for us. Let our hearts and our spirits align with you, God, that we may see what you want for us, how you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Hey, two rounds of applause, one for Jordan. Didn't she do a great job with the announcements? <laughs> Perks normally terrible at them, so I'm so glad that she did it. And for our band, too. Wasn't that just a beautiful worship time we had? I, uh, I really enjoyed Herc's messages. I did the, oh, uh, that I stand amazed. And uh, five, twelve, five, five, twelve, four, one, twenty-one, one. If you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, you weren't here last week. But it's, it's worth being here. And it's, if you, uh, you can catch all that learning, by the way, if you want to sign up online uh, for the June 30th down in Oak Ridge City, Herc's teaching the class Understanding the Bible down there. And I hear that they give free, that's this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Here he gives free Ted Drews. And for three weeks, and when you're done, they get the free study of the Bible, which is what we all uh, use in here as well today. So we jump back into the Romans series today. Hopefully you guys have been enjoying this. And we took a little break from it. But we're in Romans chapter 5. Uh, that's the good news. We're moving along. The bad news, if you don't enjoy Romans, it's got 16 chapters. Um, so we got a while to go in it. The more bad news I'll give you, I was planning on going through Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. After I worked on the message all week, I realized I can only go through Romans 5, verses 12 through 14. So at this pace, it will be in 2030 until we finish, but that's all right. Here's what I wanted to say, it's all right. The, 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 the Romans, the book of Romans, is the crown jewel of the Bible. It has so much about the Old Testament included in it and so much about the New Testament. So when you study Romans, you're studying uh, really every book that's in the Bible, all 66 books that are there. So it is a phenomenal, it is deep. Sometimes it is hard to read and understand, but we can grab it. It uh, gives us a platform to speak into today. So I am just excited about this message uh, today and really excited. I'm going to say this early. If you're a guy, if you're a man, if you're a male, if you're a dude, this message is really what I want you to listen to. And I'm going to guess that for some of us, it's going to be a little convicting. For some of us, it's going to be one of those messages where we say, yep, you're exactly right, Tom. And for a lot of the women that are here today, you're going to be thinking, I wish so-and-so would have been here. That's probably a male, a guy, or a dude. And um, I think Paul would want it that way. He wrote it that way. About a week ago, I took an airline flight and went down to Florida. Uh, we had a big stuff camp in Florida that was phenomenal this year for teenagers. And I flew down there. We flew out of the Belleville Airport because we were cheap and we wanted to buy a Legion air flight. So uh, that's how we flew out of there. And we flew down to, that's a very small airport, and we flew into a small airport that was just really somewhere north of Panama City. Normally you could fly into the Panama City Beach Airport, but this airline doesn't, so it's about an hour away, so we flew into that one. It's also a small airline. When we were there, the policeman uh, made the statement who was there, and some of the security guards made the statement, this was the busiest day that that uh, airport had ever had in their history. They'd never seen more people. So I knew it, and here's, here's why I knew it. When we landed, our flight left at 11. Let's see, I think it left 11. We were supposed to arrive at 1. Everything was right on, like 1220. Everything was right on. We, we, we pulled in, and then uh, the guy comes on, the, the pilot comes on the announcement and says, uh, we're going to have to sit here on the tarmac for a while. Uh, they don't have a gate open for us. So we sat there for an hour and a half. The flight took an hour and 20 minutes, all right? The, I sat on the tarmac for an hour and a half with, he said, in 15 minutes, we should be in the gate. Every 15 minutes, he gave another uh, story, which turned out not to be true. There's, it's, it, there's lightning, we, we can't, we got to come in, they're going to bring out a little ramp thing for you to go down. It didn't work. So an hour and a half, uh, we sat on the tarmac. Then when we got inside, the place was a literally, literally a zoo of people. 
normally I think that the whole airline facility would hold about 500 people, and there are about 5,000 people. I'm not exaggerating. You were literally walking over people wherever you went. <clears throat> we were then at the luggage area, and we waited another two and a half hours for our luggage. So four hours, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I'd be in Nashville right now. I'd be in about Atlanta right now. If I'd have driven this morning, I'd be. So we waited literally about four and a half hours after we arrived to um, get our luggage. Now, I was calm and cool, and my wife wasn't as calm as cool as I was. And it's a true statement because I'd, I'd mentally tell myself, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because the anger of man does not bring about the righteous life that God desires, right? And I thought that some of you might be flying on that flight might see me, so I couldn't do this. So I... <laughs> but Kathy was frustrated. And she is, there's one guy, listen to this, this is the true story. The, the line to check in for security, which we didn't have to go through because we were exiting the plane, was over three football fields long, three and a half hours. So they had backed up every flight four hours. It was, and nobody had any answers. Nobody. The, the concession area where you go for the mints and everything was sold out. So think about that. All the, nobody had any answers. I didn't feel that bad because it's just me and Kathy, but there are people with little kids. But, so you're walking around and you're saying, who's responsible? Is there an allegiant agent here that can tell us what's happening? Where are our bags? Kathy's going, we saw this flight come in from Allegiant from this year. They're getting their bags already. We've been in and out. They said, well, this baggage handler. She said, they got this. So you could find nobody with responsibility. So frustrating. Isn't it frustrating when you can't find anybody that's responsible? Yes or no? It, I couldn't even deal with information, but I don't know. I don't, you'd ask people, I don't know. I don't, we don't know what's going on. It's just busy. I don't know. Who do I speak to? What's going on? Just totally uh, terrible. No responsibility at all. If you fall asleep, here's what I want you to grasp today. Your irresponsibility becomes somebody else's responsibility. Now, you all came in and you got socks today. Hold up your socks if you got a pack of socks today. Just hold them up. Right. This is a perfect example of what I'll show you. All right? If I take this sock and throw it on the floor at your house, that's my sock, it's my responsibility, but if I don't pick it up, it becomes what? Your husband's responsibility. <laughs> you understand the point I'm saying? Your irresponsibility doesn't go away, it just becomes somebody else's responsibility. You spill a glass, you're responsible for it, if you don't clean it up, it becomes somebody else's responsibility. Isn't that right? So just say it with me. Your irresponsibility becomes someone else's responsibility. That's a true statement. If you're a parent, if you're married, if you've got children, your irresponsibility just becomes somebody else's responsibility. It does not go away. And that's why you try and teach your children responsibility. Correct? That's why you want to be responsible people. That's kind of where we're going today. Um, and by the way, I just wanted to say this. These socks I bought, went and bought, uh, they're for you. You take them home. But if you choose not to and put them back in the bins, the clothes hampers that are outside, we will donate every pair to the Jefferson County Rescue Shelter uh, in Hillsboro. So if, if you need socks, they're yours. If you don't need them, I mean, I mean please do take them off. If you don't need them, then drop them in there. And this week we'll be donating about 500 pairs of socks to uh, Jefferson County Rescue Center. Psalm 3311, now we're ready to jump in with the backdrop of your irresponsibility because of someone else's responsibility with the question you're going to be asking, whose responsibility is it? Who's responsible? That's where we're going. That's where Paul's going to go in this letter to the Romans, but I got to do a little background work here first. Psalm 3311, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. In other words, God doesn't change. How he started this stuff, he has his plans. It's the same way through all generations. The God of 3,000 years ago, it will be the God of 3,000 years in the future. That is our God. He doesn't change. And aren't you glad? All right? He doesn't change like shifting sands. He doesn't change like a spouse who wants to walk away. He doesn't change like a kid who becomes a bad seed or a good seed. He doesn't change. He is God and he is good. He is good God Almighty. I almost sang that, didn't I? All right. 
Hebrews 13, 8, the Hebrew writer says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Our God does not change. Here's the point. If you're coming here for the first time, here's a couple things that we believe. We believe that scripture is timeless, that the holy word of God was given to us to reveal who Jesus is and to tell us how to live as Jesus would, would want us to live. The scripture is timeless, therefore it's timely. I mean, since it really has no out of date, out of expiration time period, it's timely. It comes in today. Then this also, it doesn't just tell us what happened. I'm going to read a story today that tells you what happened. It tells us what always happens. This always happens. The story I'm going to read from you, we know that it was written 3,500 years ago. I'm going to read Genesis, but it, it's, it's timeless. It doesn't tell you just what happened, but it tells you what always happens. That's just the way that it is. That's what scripture does. That's why scripture is amazing. So the scripture we're going through today is Romans 12, Romans 5, 12 through 14. Like I said, I'd hoped, I, I wish to get through uh, 15 through 21. I don't think I'm going to get there today. I, I, I mean, I know I'm not. I wanted to hit this hard because I think this is culturally probably exactly where we're at right now. And I believe the biggest problem in culture that we have. This, this message I give you. This is where, if I could speak this to every man and woman, with emphasis on man, I would. All right. I'm going to read this section of scripture. It's titled, Death Through Adam and Life Through Christ. That's really how the Bible writers gave it a little subtitle. And I'm going to read it just 12 through 14. Therefore... Just as sin entered the world through one man, let me back up. Uh, the therefore, I guess I'll reference this. In the first five chapters of Romans, I'm going to sum this up in two sentences, but there's a lot more to it. How many of you guys have enjoyed Romans? And you've grown. Remember, we, we, no, plus we started this into Easter, and I said I wanted you to grow in your love for Christ and your faith. That was the whole goal. It's the whole goal of this series. But here's what we learned. We learned that we're the problem. All right. We're not the solution. In other words, I'm the problem. It's not him, it's not her, it's not that, it's not that. I'm the problem. All right? Jesus is the solution. That's what Paul's telling you, that you're the problem. You're, you're the problem. In our world, it is the way that it is. You're the problem, and Jesus is the solution. And the second thing we learned was we're not the judge. Jesus is. We're not the judge, Jesus is. Okay, now back into where we're at. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and that man was called Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, before the Ten Commandments came, before the Bible first started. They're saying that sin was in the world before that, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam when Adam sinned. Death reigned to the time of Moses when the law came, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. They died and they paid the price of sin, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. That verse, the pattern of the one to come, I will talk about at the end. In other words, we have Adam, who brought sin into the world, and then the one to come, the pattern is Jesus, a better Adam. That's what I'll tell you. All right? Okay. Anybody confused yet? All right, we're going to try and clear this up for you a little bit. Since I told you that sin came through one man, through Adam, you could... We'll argue about this in two weeks. Not this week, because I don't have time. We'll argue about this in two weeks. All because of that sin and death came into the world. Nobody's escaped that. You are a sinner. You have no choice in the matter. You will sin. And you say, that seems unfair. It may seem unfair, but it's still true. You will sin. And I, can I even say this? Is, and this is what Paul said there. Even if Adam didn't sin, you would have. I would have. You would have disobeyed God some way, some shape, or fo some form. Just a real quick show of hands. How many of you in this room are sinners? Raise your hand. Yeah, and if you're not, you're a liar, so you are a sinner. All right? <laughs> so everybody's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not a comparison factor. I'm not comparing to myself to the person sitting next to me. It's between a holy God and a perfect God. All right. So Paul's making a case, and he's talking about this guy named Adam, that sin came into the world through him. And then he's going to make a case in just a little while about the pattern of Jesus. So I got to talk a little bit about Adam. Because this is what I believe Paul would have known about Adam. This is what I think a lot of us don't know about Adam and we miss about Adam. Adam's the father of man. That's, that's really what we believe. That he's the, the first man that was created. And I think I have it in my notes somewhere, but I'm going to jump ahead. 
I believe God created Adam. I believe that. He created Adam and Eve. I don't believe we're part animal and part human. I don't believe we're a transitional species. I don't. That's the, that's the problem with have of evolution. So with all that said, I'm not trying to debate parts of evolution. I'm just saying I think God created man, fully man, Adam and Eve. That's where I believe. And I think I've got plenty of evidence for it, plenty of things to talk about it. It just won't be on this message today. Here's Genesis 3, 6 through 13. We're going to go back to the very beginning. 30, written 3,500 years ago. And there's Adam that God created Adam, and now there's Eve. God had created Eve. And Eve wanted to do right. She wanted to do right, but she was deceived by the serpent, who we know as Satan. Adam, um, we say, was the first human to sin, but realistically, I guess if we push back further, we could go to the angels and Satan and say they're the first sinners. They're the first ones that first disobeyed God and were cast out of the heavenly realms. That's where we have. So, but Adam's the first guy with sin, the first human that did it. So here's where we read, Genesis 3, 6 through 13. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Who are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And then the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Adam had just one thing that he couldn't do. He couldn't eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil because God said, if you do, it's going to bring death into the world. In two weeks, we'll talk about the implications of that. But we know it's true because everybody, what? Dies. It brought death into every part of the world. And all God was telling Adam was, this is just the one thing. Just, you, got one, you, you got the whole garden. You, know, you guys are going to do great. It's going to be perfect. Everything's perfect for you. Just don't do this. If you do, it's going to bring something really bad that maybe you can't understand right now. And by the way, most of the times when we sin, we can't understand what it's going to bring. We only see it after the fact. So what God was saying is, you just need to trust me. Just trust me. Don't do this. Trust me. I'm going to give you freedom, but trust me. Don't do this. Just walk with me and don't try and supplant me. Just come alongside with me and don't try and be me. All right. Have you ever had people say, well, I just don't believe God. Here's the way I believe it is. Okay, well, you're not God. Quit trying to be God. That's gone on a long time. That's nothing new that people think they're God and they think God's not or he's less than. That's nothing new in the spectrum. Theologians call this sin of Adam the original sin, by the way. So as I read this, there's two questions, and this is going to be a fairly quick uh, message. I hope I've said that before, but I think it's going to be, all right? There's two questions that I want to ask in this passage. Number one, you guys can all answer this, so all eyes on me, even if you're uh, not a follower of Scripture or you're not a Christian, you you can still answer this. Who sinned first, Adam or Eve? Eve, Right? She took the apple. She said it looked good. good for, she had good reasons for it. She said she took it. She ate it. And then she gave some to Adam and he ate it. Correct? Eve was the first one to sin. She was the original sinner. Who did God, who did God call first after that? Adam. Adam. He called to the man and said, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Eve sinned, and God said it was Adam's responsibility. Adam, you're head of the family. She sinned. You're responsible. Pretty big deal. What happens in the Bible will always happen again because the Bible's timeless. 
What did Adam do while Eve sinned? He sat passively by and did nothing but watch. He was basically absent, silent, and passive, like most men today. Absent, silent, and passive, and taking no responsibility. Today's message, and virtually, can, this is a secret too, most of my messages are directed towards men. You want to know where we're going to go with this? It's going to get heavier. There were, Adam sat there and watched this. What was the repercussions to Eve? Terrible pain, loss, dysfunction, problems. When he did not take responsibility for something he should have been responsible for being part of. Now, it doesn't absolve Eve. She had responsibility too. Of course she did. But when you read this story, you cannot... You read it and you realize Eve sinned first and yet God called in Adam. God said to Adam, where are you? Where are you? God held the man firstly responsible, but not solely responsible. God speaks to the man and then the woman, both responsible, but the man first. In other words, God threw a sock down. Who's responsible for this mistrust of who I am? Who's responsible for breaking a covenant between man and people? Who's responsible? Adam, you're responsible, not Eve. If you wanted to know who the question was, whether it was Eve was responsible for it, no, it was Adam. It was Adam he was responsible for that. Adam, where are you? What did he answer? I was afraid, so I hid. That's called the sin of omission. I didn't want to hear, I didn't want to enter this conflict. I didn't want to be part of this, so he hid. I didn't want to argue. I didn't want to enter this tunnel of chaos. I didn't want it to be hard. I wanted it to be easy. He was cowardly. He, he didn't want to stop anything. He didn't want to be voiced. How many of you, and don't raise your hand, know of a man who's silent, absent, cowardly, should speak up, should stand up, and never has, and your family's paid a price for it? Don't Don't nod. I already know the answer. What did he do? Adam, where are you? He says, well, I was afraid, so I hid. I find men shriek away and they hide away. 65% of all churches are women, 35% are men. Where are the men? I can tell you where they're at. They're at home hiding, shrieking. What did he do? Where are you, Adam? He blamed who? Say it. He blamed who? He blamed the woman. Now, I'm not saying she wasn't at fault for that. But Adam, it was your what? Say it with me. Your responsibility. If you'd have stood up, spoke up, encouraged, maybe it would have changed. but you showed no responsibility and you just made excuses. Now again, this is, I know this is heavy. It's gotta be heavy though. This is the problem with our culture right now. If it does not change, we are doomed to hell. Can I say it any stronger? And not me, I won't see this, but my children and my children's children will. So I'm gonna fight. Anybody with me? We're gonna fight. The church always fights. This is not a new problem. This is just a big problem right now. It's not new. It can be changed. So then what did Eve do? Well, she blamed Satan. She gave an excuse there as well. And what have you done? So here's a question. I just want to just pause just for a second. And I want you to feel this, men. Listen. God's entrusted you with an amazing responsibility. Do you know why? He trusts you. He loves you. He's equipped you. He's given you a position in the bride of Christ that is unique, in the family that's unique. If you had a dad that was absent, you've regretted that. If you've had a dad that was present, that spoke into your life, that that was there, you know the value of that, of a man. 
So here's a good question to ask today. I'm asking the men, where are you? Where are you with your wife? Where are you? What are you doing? Are you fighting for that relationship? Are you fighting for your wife? Are you encouraging, giving hope, pouring beauty in, protecting? Where are you in leading your family spiritually? I'm very thankful a lot of women step up, but I, I, I wish you didn't have to. It would be so, so much better for your family, I believe, for the unique equipping of, of, I think, men sometimes to do this in a different way. Where are you with providing for your family financially? How about protecting your family? Where are you at? Do they, does your family feel safe? Where are you in your church? We're, we're, we are starting this men's ministry. We started it a year ago because we saw this, an epidemic problem. We had about 100 men show up, which was great. I was stunned by that many. We only had 50 signed up. But if you weren't there, you should have been because we've got a job, we've got a responsibility. And the whole world hangs in balance. Your family hangs in balance. Where are you in your community? Remember the stats I gave, I guess it's now three weeks ago? 15% of all Asian families are fatherless. 25% of all white families are fatherless. 40% of all Hispanic families are fatherless. And 65% of all black families are fatherless. That is a tragedy of men. You want to know the problem in those cultures, in every culture? This is it. You can point out whatever you want. I'm not talking about history. History did a lot of people wrong. I got it. But this one problem of men not being men, not stepping up, not taking responsibility, that's your problem. That's the main issue. And when that happens, Satan has a field day. We live in a culture I just, I don't even know if I should say it. I'm going to say it. We live in a culture that has replaced husbands and fathers with the government. And we wonder why we have problems. We need husbands and fathers to lead their homes, accept responsibility, love, and protect their family. Okay. Everybody take a big sigh of relief right now. Well, God loves you. All right. And I don't want you to get mad at me. I'm just bringing the truth. It's, it's your responsibility to determine to it. I have my own family I have to watch over and shepherd and be responsible for. Here's the big, I guess I just want to say, this doesn't mean, I, and I want you to hear this clearly, this doesn't mean the man is the boss and the woman is the employee. It does not mean that. You're equals, you're co-leaders with ultimately the man taking the first responsibility. Okay, I'll say it this way. At our church, we have three pastors, myself, Herc, and Josh. Most churches are amazed at the fact that we have three paid people in a church of roughly 3,500 to 4,000 people. They normally have a staff of 50 to 100. They said, Tom, how does that work? How does that possibly work? And I said, because I delegate authority to people that I know can do the job, whether it's the band, whether it's the tech team, whether it's with kids, whether it's with parking lot, whether it's in the bookstore. So I delegate authority. I delegate authority. But I never, as senior pastor, abdicate responsibility. If something bad happens in the children's ministry, it is my what? It is my responsibility. You don't have to look around the airport and find somebody that's hiding. You can come right to me and say, Tom, the church did this. It was wrong. It was bad. I am responsible. That's what God did to men. He, he delegated authority to you, and he delegated authority to women, but he will hold men responsible for their families. He will hold men responsible for their families. And when you have a family where nobody takes responsibility, then it's just blame shifting. That's all it is. And if you've been in a family that all they do is, eh, 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 it's because nobody's taking responsibility, and I will say it's the man. Because I think that's right. You make decisions together 
under the guidance and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. But the man is ultimately, firstly, responsible. My wife and I, Kathy, we, she will tell you, we make virtually every decision together. I wouldn't make a big decision without her wanting to agree with it. We talk the things through. We pray the things through. But ultimately, I know if that thing didn't work that we agreed with or she chose, I am responsible. I am responsible. Can I get an amen? It's the way. My kids want that. Dad, you allowed this. Dad, she did this, but you were, Dad, I know. Can I say this too? A man becomes a man when he takes responsibility. A boy with responsibility is called a what? A man. A man that is irresponsible is called a what? A boy. I'm tired of seeing 30-year-old and 40-year-old boys. You, you want to lift, a put, if you're a man, you want to have some of this responsibility on your back. It makes you drive straighter. That's why we ask men to serve. We ask people to serve. The people that love the church, they've taken responsibility. I've delegated authority. I've not abdicated my role. I won't. Someday God will take me out and say, you're done, you're gone. Then some other senior pastor has to delegate authority, train and lead in a godly manner, and then never abdicate the responsibility of the problems or the successes or the failures of that church. A man that doesn't take responsibility is called a boy, and they need to grow up. They need to grow up. Men who run from conflict are like Adam. Men who accept conflict are like Jesus. Men who make excuses are like Adam. Men who make plans around the authority of God are like Jesus. Men who avoid responsibility are like Adam. Men who take responsibility are like Jesus. Men who dump burdens on women and children are like Adam. Men who carry burdens for women and children are like Jesus. This is the human problem. It started a long time ago. It is an epidemic today of blame shifting, of people, of culture, of history, of races, of generations. It is blame shifting and no responsibility is being taken and Satan is having a field day in that area. We should stop thinking about having a good time and begin thinking, men, about leaving a good legacy. Can I say it again? Quit worrying about having a good time. And start thinking about the legacy that you're leaving. When Adam blew it, he probably wasn't thinking about his legacy. I don't know if Adam's going to be in heaven or not, but I don't particularly care to meet him. Made excuses. You know, the Bible talks about the sins of the father visiting the sins of the son on the second and third generation. And it's not a forced thing. It's just a thing thing. Whatever legacy your dad left. You, and can I say this? If it's a bad legacy, it, you know it's, it's affected the generations behind. Can I say this? You can change this. Today, you can change this. You can start the process right now. You can stop the generational sin of your father and change it. I mean, I love the fact my mom and dad would have said that they were Christians but growing up, but we never talked about God, never. I bumped into God. I, I, it's a miracle I bumped into Kathy, and through Kathy, I bumped into God. And the legacy could have been loving parents but no relationship with God. could have been tragic. The legacy changed somehow, I don't know why, through Myself becoming a Christian, and my brothers became Christians, and my sisters became, my sister became a Christian. And the legacy that I'm leaving now, my son is a pastor. Is it a surprise? Is it a surprise? No. It's not, because the legacy I'm trying to leave him is an imperfect father trying to follow a perfect father. That's the legacy, one of honesty and of truth. And he sees that. Herc. My brother who became a Christ follower. Is it a surprise that Josh has followed and his sisters as well? It's not. It's, people have a free choice. And, and by the way, Matt could have told me and Katie could have told me, take a long walk. I don't care about Jesus. I got it. You have that choice. But the legacy that we were leaving kind of set the table. Amen? You can set the table. Men, where are you? 
Where are you? If you read the Bible and you think it means that you're the boss, then you, you've read it wrong. It means you're responsible. Scripture says that as Jesus gave up his life, this is a tough one, for the church, for us, you are supposed to give up your life for your wife. You're supposed to serve. You, you want to know how to love them? Read 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. Does not envy, is not rude, does not boast, is not selfish. Keeps no record of wrongs, not easily angered. That's how you love. Not, not, not bossing over people. And I've had a lot of Christians tell me before, well, she's supposed to listen to me, she's supposed to submit. And my answer is, is you've read the Bible wrong. You're supposed to love. You're supposed to protect. You're supposed to be responsible. You're supposed to be involved. You're supposed to be present. Not domineering, not harsh, not overbearing. Can you believe that Paul talks about Adam and he knew about Adam? Just a little sideline here. This is a total sideline. Paul was single. And he, t and he makes a statement that's somewhat controversial. And it's not when you look at it from this point of view. He says it's better that you be single than married. And he says, here's the why. He says, because I can give full devotion to Jesus. But if I'm married, I'm responsible for who? Full devotion to who? My wife and Jesus. He said, but if I'm single... I, can, I, don't, I don't have that responsibility of taking care of my family. I have the responsibility of going full force to, to Jesus. He knew that if he got married, that he had a responsibility that came along with it. He knew that he had a responsibility as a son to take care of his mom. Children. I'm going to close with this. In Adam, I want to put this on the screen. In Adam, we have ruin. In Jesus, we have rescue. In Adam, we have sin. In Jesus, we have righteousness. In Adam, we have death. In Jesus, we have life. In Adam, we have separation from God. In Jesus, we have a relationship with God. In Adam, we have disobedience. In Jesus, we have obedience. In Adam, we have judgment. In Jesus, we have deliverance. In Adam, we have the law. In Jesus, we have grace. Adam turned from the Father. All right, let me go back. Just one thing before I finish this last thing. Paul said in Romans 12 through 14, which is why I couldn't go any further, if I went verses 15 through 21, we wouldn't get out of here until 1 o'clock, okay? So I'm trying to give you the first part of this. Remember, this has got five more verses as part of this. But at the end of verse uh, 14, it says, even over those who did not sin by breaking the commandments, did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. See, Adam is a pattern of the one to come. And Jesus is a better pattern. Jesus is the greater Adam. Jesus is, is the great I am. So Adam turned from the Father in a garden. And Jesus turned to the Father in a garden. Adam was naked and ashamed. Jesus was nearly naked and bore our shame. Adam sinned at a tree. Jesus bore our sin on a tree. Adam brought us thorns. Jesus wore a crown of thorns. Adam died as a sinner, and Jesus died for sinners. My responsibility, mine, Now, more than ever, men, step up. When you use the bathroom, you flush whatever's in the bathroom. It goes down. Stink goes down. You have to step up. You have to step up and not be part of the flushing. You need to step up and step out. That's the easiest way I can say it. Graphically, do you want to be part of the thing that flushes stuff away or do you want to be part of the thing that steps up and steps away and steps out into the beauty of Christ and God? Do you want to do, can I just say this? 
what God's equipped you to do? And you might say, well, my earthly father, he was not a great role model. He did not equip me well. I know that. That's why we have God and we have his scripture, we have his spirit, we have his word. I've seen men that had terrible families that I could bring up on stage, and next week I probably will. That, that they're, they're right now, you would never understand that they had a problem before, and now they're a leader, they're a lover, they're kind, they take responsibility. There's no question that they stepped up to the spiritual role in their family. Can you women look at somebody that's next to you, a man, that, and you don't have to know him, and just say, look, you're enough. God has equipped you. Just say that. Just do me a favor. Just point to somebody. Just some God. I, let them know. I don't want this to feel like a bashing. I don't. I want this to feel like an encouragement. But I want it to be truth. Would we all agree that we have a group of people that do not want to take a respons responsibility? Amen, yes or no? And if they did, if we just all of a sudden stood up and said, okay, no, look, I know you did this, but I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to be part of the solution or part of the prevention. It's not about punching a clock and being here at church every Sunday. I'm not telling you that. But I'm also not not telling you that. It's a big deal. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that you can set us free. God, I thank you for the scripture that says love overcomes a multitude of sins. Father, I thank you. And I'm speaking to you directly, God, on behalf of all of us. I thank you for the times that we were broken and hurting. And when we loved well like your son, when we trusted you, when we turn to you, that that overcame some tough marriage problems, some tough relational problems, some tough issues in our life. God, I thank you for Paul. And I thank you that he was bold. He took responsibility. Even when it wasn't his responsibility, he stood up. God, I thank you for that. We love you and we praise you. It is in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing. Hold on.
special service for you for 4th of July, so if you wanted to hear Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, you heard them this week, if you want to hear 15 through 21, you're going to have to come back in two weeks, the sub part of this. It gives us a lot of answers. With that said, before we leave, I'm asking every woman to sit, every man to stay standing. Every woman, please sit. Every I shouldn't have to say this, but if I'm speaking to men, it implies that there are men. There are men, and there are women. God's given you a unique responsibility, a unique obligation, and a unique calling to do something that he's equipped every one of you to do through his word, through his church, through his body, to love more, to be strong, to be influencers, to take responsibility, not to be at a place like an airport where you're running around and everybody's lost and everybody's angry and everybody's mad and everybody's upset, but you're able to stand up and say, I'm here. And God will use you when you step up. Not because you're superior, talented, but because God will always use people that are willing to trust and follow him. He always does. In two weeks, I'm going to ask you to come back because we're going to talk about the powerful solution to how a man can fulfill his responsibility fully. And can I even say this? It's how your wife it's how your daughters, it's how your mom, it's how every woman wants you to respond. And most importantly, it's how God's made you to respond if you understand this. And it's powerful. It's the most powerful thing on planet Earth. God, I pray your blessings upon every man here. I pray they come out of here convicted and encouraged and understand, dear God, that uh, the question that we need to ask ourselves all the time is, where are we? Where are we? Why are we doing this? Where are we at? to be part of our families, to, to be active in them. Dear God, help us to, to throw on a switch. Maybe it's a slow switch of change. Maybe it's a quick one. But God, we need you in this. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the, your church. We thank you for this place. We thank you for this time. And I praise you for every man here. I praise you for every woman as well, God. We love you. It's in your son's name. And all God's people said, amen. See you guys next week. Thanks for coming. <laughs>